Mark Cola bottle. I hope everybody's doing well. Another COVID week, but we made it through it. I hope you're doing well. To all you moms out there, I want to wish you a mo happy Mother's Day. It's a, it's a great day to be a mom. You guys are doing a great job. You know, as I think about moms, I, I have to say thank you to my wife, Linda. She is the most amazing mom. She raised four children, homeschooled them, managed the house, and all that's involved with that. And that allowed me to follow God's calling in my life. So thank you, Linda. You did a great job. I am uh, going to pray, but men, uh, I know we had a good turnout signing up for the men's groups. Uh, most of them should be getting started this week, so guys, check your emails and make sure you uh, follow up. Uh, I think there's about 18 to 20 guys signed up, so that's exciting. Um, anyway, I think that's it. Let me pray, and we're going to get started today. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you that we can be here. We thank you for all the moms that uh, are in our church and just moms in general. We just thank you so much for them. Moms just hold the family together. I thank you for my mom. When I think of my mom, I think of a mom who always loved me and always was there for me when I needed her. I thank you for her. I thank you for my wife and her faithful uh, ministry to our children. Father, uh, we just thank you for uh, Jason and Kim being able to sell their house. We celebrate with them. We pray for Tom's dad, Bart, as he continues his treatment. Just watch over him. Father, just watch over our church. We know that uh, some folks are dealing with uh, challenges at work. Some are underemployed right now. We just pray that you would meet their needs. Father, uh, we know that um, the Harwood's neighbor is home from the hospital. We just rejoice that he's doing better. And Father, we just pray that you will continue to guide us in this time that's uh, something we've never gone through. So guide us and help us each week just follow you and walk with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. We are going to continue our series in Ecclesiastes. But uh, before we get into that, I just need to share a couple of things. But my hope for each of you today as we get into our message is you'll take a fresh look at your own life in reference to reverence and respect that you have for God. My message today is entitled, Attitude Check, and we're going to be looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. When you think of attitude check, it's like checking yourself out. So I hope as a result to today's message, you'll do a check. You'll check yourself out. So one question I want you to consider in today's message is, what should my attitude be as I worship God? Do I have a proper attitude towards God? Do I fear God, respecting Him for who He is? And do I acknowledge Him for a sustaining work every moment of every day? Before we dig into Ecclesiastes, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a near-death experience? I'm talking about one that you thought you could die. I mean, you know, real close to death. I'm going to give you an example. When I was in high school, one night after work, I worked at the ice rink, I was heading home. And as I drove across the bridge, I quickly realized that it was a sheet of ice. And the car in front of me had just slid off the road. So I began to try to change lanes to avoid hitting them, and my car was not responding. I was heading right towards this car that had just crashed. I thought I was going to die. Praise God, right before I hit him, my car moved to the left. That was a scary moment. That was a very scary moment. It made me think a little bit. You know, uh, last week, with the COVID time, we have been watching some different things on documentaries. I decided to watch this, watch this documentary called Charge. It's about a young chef named Eduardo Garcia. He was hiking in the mountains of Montana where he came across this metal box and inside the metal box was a dead bear. So in his curiosity, he decided to go up and check it out. And in so doing, he touched this metal box, which caused him to be shocked with 2,400 volts of electricity. It almost killed him, tearing his body apart 
and he was he barely made it back. In the rest of the documentary is his amazing fight to recover. No, he doesn't have this amazing life change where he turns to God, but through his challenges, he begins to examine his own life. As he reflects on his life, it's his hurts and his pains, he begins to see his self-centeredness and his ungratefulness. Question. When was the last time you sat before God? In his presence, your focus was totally on him. You worshipped him. You praised him. And you thanked him for everything in your life. When was that? When was the last time that happened? You know, in this documentary, what hit me most about Eduardo was he came to have a new appreciation for his life. He appreciated all the people who helped him recover from his accident. It was, it was year long. It took him a while to recover. I think a couple years. But Eduardo was a very selfish person before he had this accident. He was very centered on himself. And after this accident, he began to see his shortcomings, and he began to make changes. I don't know about you, but I see a lot of myself in Eduardo, putting my interests interest first above others. This doc documentary made me think, do I treat others as more important? How about God? How do I treat God? Turn with me to Ecclesiastes Chapter 5, 1 through 7. Let me pray. Father God, guide us as we look into your word now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Guard your steps as you go into the house of God. Draw near and listen rather than offer your sacrifices of fools. For they do not know they are doing evil. Do not be hasty in words or impulses and thoughts to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For dreams come through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it. He takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It's better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. Today we're going to talk about fearing God. As you look at that passage I just read, you could make a quick outline that says, point one, the proper attitude of worship, verse one. Point two, the proper practice of prayer, verses two through three. And point three, the proper payment of, of vows, verses four through seven. However, that's not, that's not the point. That's really not the main point. They are important parts, but the preacher is warning us of the folly of rash vows, which could cause a person to lose the fruit of his labor through God destroying the work of his hands. Do you want everything you do to be destroyed because you are doing it inappropriately? The preacher warns us against the follies of rash vows, which he calls the sacrifice of fools. Why does he give us this warning? For they don't even know what they're doing is evil, in verse 1. What is the point? We need to come ready to listen to God, not just talk to hear ourselves speak. We are encouraged to come before God ready to listen to Him. When you come before God, are you ready to listen? Are you ready to speak? We need to come ready to listen. The preacher also reminds us in the scripture, it's clear that it's better to listen than to talk. The picture is of someone who has just started, starts babbling without any forethought. Just talk, 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 not, not thinking about what he's saying. Secondly, the preacher states, don't be hasty in words or impulsive in thoughts to bring up a matter 
in God's presence. The point of the preacher is making is to refuse to make a proper decision is to harden one's heart. When a person has heart trouble, what happens? It causes his arteries to harden and the blood doesn't flow properly. This causes the heart not to function. So when you come before the Lord God, we need to learn to be still, to be quiet, to have control, to have self-control, and learn to listen, not to be hardened, but to be moldable and teachable. So we can hear from God. Don't be hardened, but listen. Thirdly, the preacher reminds us of God's position. So when you think about God, where is God at? It said God is in heaven, verse 2. God is in heaven. Where are we at? We are here on earth. Okay? The message is clear to me. God is above us, sitting in heaven, and he has authority over us. God sees everything from a different perspective. He sees it from heaven. We have a limited view. We're here in the middle of earth, in the middle of all this chaos. So, what the preacher is trying to tell us in verse 3 is regarding dreams. What's he say about dreams? One commentary states it this way. As dreams come through a multitude of busyness, so nonsensical speech is a result of too many words. Too many words, too many words. The fourth point the preacher warns us of is making a vow and not keeping it. The point is you are better off in not making a vow than to make a vow and not keep it. What does the preacher say at this? He says, failure to fulfill a vow to God causes one to sin. The preacher even states it a little stronger. He calls those who make a vow without keeping it fools. When you talk too much and you don't listen, we are being fools. Don't be called a fool. So if you make a vow to God, keep it. God takes no delight in fools. The preacher further warns us, saying that we anger God on the account of our voice, causing him to destroy the works of our hand. Everything the preacher has said so far brings out one conclusion in verse 7. Verse 7 says, Rather, fear God. That's what I want to talk about today, fearing God. Fearing God. That word fear, what does that mean? It's the Hebrew word yar, meaning to fear, to revere, to be feared, to be dreadful, to be reverenced, to terrify, to make afraid. We should have a fear of God, not like God's going to judge us, but a fear and respect of God. Another suggestion Solomon makes is to fear God, that is to trust, obey. I'm, I want to read something I found from Dr. Roy uh, Zook. He's a seminary uh, professor at Dallas. Solomon makes this, Solomon says, let me start that again. Solomon suggests to fear God, that is to trust, obey, serve, and to worship Him. We should enjoy life because death is coming. Ecclesiastes 11.9 says death is coming, but we should also fear God because judgment is coming. In verse 1.9, in chapter 3.17, and 12.14, six times Solomon relays this command to fear God. Something that's repeated that many times, we need to hear it. Fear God. God has, God has so worked that men should fear him. Verse 3, chapter 3, verse 14. Chapter 5, verse 7. The man who fears God will avoid all extremes. Chapter 7, verse 18. I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. You getting the point I'm making? We need to be fearing God. It will not be well for the evil man because he does not fear God. That's in chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. But the whole book comes to a conclusion in chapter 12. Mark's going to talk about this in a few weeks. It says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. So what does it mean to fear God? What does that look like? To fear God means to stand in awe. 
to stand in all of him and depend on him, not ourselves. We need to recognize that we are human. We are finite. Whereas God, he's infinite. Ecclesiastes shows us in stunning ways that the key to life is not life in itself. Pleasure, material, wisdom, money, they're all folly. They're all futile. True happiness comes from centering our life on God, not ourselves. You see these two extremes in Ecclesiastes. The aesthetics, they practice the strict self-denial as a measure of personal and especially spiritual discipline. That's out of balance. And what do you see? What's the other extreme? Hedonism. The pursuit of pleasure. Sensual self-indulgences. Neither one or them are balanced. Instead of going to one extreme or another, believers are encouraged to do what? To fear God. The preacher tried everything. Pleasure, wine, wisdom, building projects, slaves, animal husbandry, silver and gold, singers, and a harem in chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. But he had to admit, when he surveyed it all, everything was what? Meaningless. A chasing after the wind in verse 11 of chapter 2. Have we been chasing after the wind? The secret to life then is not in things. Instead, to open the door to fulfillment, meaning and joy, what do we need to do? We need to enjoy life and fear God. Enjoy life and fear God. The teaching of the fear of God is prevalent throughout the Old Testament. Here are a few examples. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 24. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our, for our good always, for our survival as it is today. Fear the Lord. Psalms 31, 19. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. Again, this concept of fearing the Lord here is to take refuge in him. And then in Psalms 112, verse 1, Praise the Lord, how blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commands. So it's very clear of the many benefits of having a proper fear of God throughout the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Is that just the Old Testament teaching? Well, let's see. 1 Peter 2.17 Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. That's a clear teaching of, of having a fear for God. What about Luke chapter 12, verse 5? But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed you, has authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. That's to fear God. God's the one who cast us into hell. We need to fear him, not man. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Here in this passage, Paul, we see Paul teaches us about fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you. Doesn't it blow you away and also keep you humble thinking about the fact that God is working in you and me? In the New Testament, it treats the concept of the fear of God as a motive for not turning away from him. We should fear in a sense that we seek refuge in God, away from God's terrible wrath. God's grace in Christ is the refuge from God's wrath outside of Christ. Let me say that again. God's grace in Christ is the refuge from God's wrath outside of Christ. If you're outside of God, you should fear. You should fear God's judgment. In Christ, in His grace, we don't have to fear. There is terror outside of Christ. And there is a different kind of trembling inside of Christ. This reminds me of a night when I was driving to the Outer Banks. I was driving with my family, and in a distance ahead of us, 
we were following this ferocious storm. As I looked in the distance, I was seeing cloud to ground lightning. It was the most, lightning, most amazing lightning show I'd ever seen. But inside of our car, as we stayed behind the storm, we were safe. We were not in the storm. We were kind of seeing the storm. We were safe. As we learned to have a proper fear of God, we also learned to walk beside God, not to run ahead of Him or behind Him. There is safety as we walk through life with God. This week I want to encourage you to take some time to learn from the wisdom of the preacher, to enjoy life but fear God. I want to read another passage, and I just want you to think about this passage. Psalms 91. This, this passage is a very encouraging passage, but it would be a great passage for you to dwell on this week. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is he who delivers you from the snares of the trapper and from the de deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will never be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and tens of thousands at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plagues come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, that you do not strike your foot against a stone, and you will tread upon lions and cobras. The, the young lions and the serpent will you trample down. Because he loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call, he will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him in, ter in terror. Excuse me. I will rescue him and honor him with a long life, and I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. This psalm talks a lot about fear. But you sense in this passage, in this psalm, that in, in God, in Christ, as we're trusting in him, as we're fearing him properly, there's safety. Now, I'm not saying that you might not get COVID. I'm not saying you're not going to get sick, but there is safety in Christ. Today, are you in Christ? Are you living with a proper fear of him? Are you trusting him? Or are you living life in your own strength? When you come before him, are you quiet and allowing him to speak to you? Are you daily practicing the fear of the Lord and enjoying life? Maybe you're living in a lot of fear right now. Maybe you're constantly in fear. Well, if you're living in constant fear, you must not know this God who's constantly protecting us. God promises he'll be with us, he'll protect us. But part of it is we have to fear him. We have to honor him. We have to respect him. We have to walk with him. As we continue this series, we need to realize that the point is to fear God, to fear God and enjoy life. My hope is that you're experiencing that. You're experiencing the joy that comes from knowing Christ. And you're not always in fear. You're not always in worry. Psalms chapter 20 verse 7 says, Some just trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Can you say that today, that you're trusting in the Lord our God? Are you walking in fear of him? Are you coming before him humbly, allowing him to speak to you and direct you? You know, there's days where I rush ahead of God, and those are the days I often trip over myself. But when I take a moment and step back 
and say, God, this is the day you've given me. Help me honor you. Help me serve you. I begin to get a sense as I get into his word, as I pray, that God has a plan for me that day. It might not be the plan I had, but as I seek him and have a proper fear of him and I trust in him, I experience a peace that passes all understanding. I experience that peace. So if you're not experiencing peace, the question is, do you even know him? Do you even know him? If you don't know him, you need to be afraid because you don't have a relationship with him. But you can. You can. It's clear. It says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So I pray that you do know that you can trust in him and that you don't have to fear everything in life. You know, there's a proper fear. That's a respect. It's not a fear like he's going to smack you. No, he loves you. And he has good things in store for us. He has lots of good things in store for us. So reflect on that this week. Go back and look at Psalms 91 this week. Take some time and process that. And as you deal with different things this week, don't run ahead of God. Take some time. Come before him. Commit the day to him. Pray. Ask God to direct your steps. Make sure you're in alignment. Mark talked about that in his last year's alignment. Well, this is kind of related. The fear of the Lord helps us stay in alignment. And that's what we need. We all need to fear God. So that's my encouragement today. Let me pray. Father God, help us walk in the fear of the Lord. Help us know that if we're trusting in you and not our own strength, that you're going to guide us, you're going to protect us. No matter what we have to go through, you're going to be there with us. You're never going to leave us or forsake us. Doesn't mean it's all going to be easy, but you will be there with us. And one day you will come for us again to take us to be with you for eternity. So, Father, help us keep our eyes fixed on you. And, Father, I look for that day when I go to be with you again in heaven. That day when I will receive a, a crown of life. The day when I will get a new body. I know I'm getting older, but one day I'll be young again because I'll be like you. I look forward to that day. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don, I, I can't think of anything for you and I to talk about, so maybe we can some find some dude off the streets who can... Uh, so, yeah. Hey, whoa, what do you... Hey, hey, pal, local, we, uh, local bricklayer. You want to <laughs> ask us some questions here? Well, I thought it was time to kind of like stir the pot up a little bit. Uh, I'm a little nervous now. Uh, everybody's in blue, and I decided to actually... Well, you got a blue collar on. Go on, blue collar, Hey, this, yeah. this is for our football team. This is Pompey or Liverpool, right? Okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, um, of course, uh, I've already heard the sermon because, uh, I was actually filming it, but, um, it brought up some questions and some thoughts about the fear of the Lord, um, and I'm, I have a very kind of practical sort of, sort of, uh, turn, um, so my first thought really is, um, just practically, um, how does the, how does the fear of the Lord work, you know, when I get up Monday morning, how does this, um, how, when I'm meditating and thinking about fearing God, how does that change, for example, the way, um, the way I even maybe spend my time? Or what, what would you say to that? That's a really good question because we don't want to just talk about these church concepts that are meaningless for the rest of the week. I think, when I think of fearing the Lord, I think it really starts with a constant awareness of His presence and that everything I do, he sees. And that's a challenge on the one hand because he does uh, judge in, in a sense, but it's also a comfort because I know he's always there. I'm never out of his sight. Yeah. I, I'm thinking of the idea, Mark, that, that um, God is sovereign. And as I fear him and, but also trust him, he's got everything under control. I need to daily think of him. I need to include him in my life. It's not, it's not, I'm not directing my life. He is. So as I go to work, remember that he put me in that workplace for a purpose. And the people that I run into are people that he put there. So I need to bring Christ into my conversations. I need to be ready to give an answer of the hope I have in Christ. Um, 
And, you know, and remember, you know, it's okay. You know, I might not have all the answers, but God is sovereign. He's in control. So let's boil this down to a few, like, scenarios, whatever. Some maybe some positive, some negative, right? Um, what about, say, what about the student or the young person who's looking down the line, maybe would have graduated this year or maybe in a couple of years or whatever, or is already graduated and thinking, what, um, you know, what's actually going to happen here to me? Um, how does the fear of the Lord um, come into that situation? How, how, how would you address that with that person? Well, I'm thinking of the fact that part of the fear of the Lord is to have a confidence in Him and His Word, right? And what does His Word say? I know the plans I have for you, plans of good, not of evil. I think God has a plan for each one of us. doesn't mean it's going to be simple. You know, you graduated this year, it's probably going to be hard to get a job. But can we still trust in God to provide for us, to take care of us? Yes. Like I said in my message, he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. So he's going to be with you and walk with you in that hard time and the good time. Okay, let's... Yeah. Well, I would even say specifically last week we talked about work, and that's God's normal means of provision. But we're in a, in a very abnormal time, so... I think God can use extenuating ways, and, and Don, I think you're right on, is that we, we press into him and we can trust him no matter what. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's do another situation, maybe more negative, uh, especially now for the guys. What about the guy who's late at night, he's on his own, he's looking at the internet, he's fed up, he's, you know, how does the fear of God play into that situation? Well, I, I think the fear of God there is... God, I may think I'm alone in this room in front of my screen, but I'm not alone because you're right here with me. And why on earth would I want to drag you into what I'm doing right now? And I think that fear should remind him that if he's truly a believer, where does Christ live? Christ lives inside of him. And that should bring him to his knees and bring him to repentance. You know, hey, we're all going to make mistakes, but if you really practice remembering that I need to fear him, I need to walk with him, he needs to be a part of my life, that when I blow it, I can go to him, I can confess it. It doesn't justify us sinning, but we need to, hey, wow, I've done something. There should be a, a fear, like, wow, I've really blown it. Um, but there also is that reminder in, in like, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. There is forgiveness and there's cleansing. And part of that's, a fear of God. I, I fear God, but I also know that He can forgive me, and He will. Okay. All right, one last scenario. What about the person now who's been stuck at home, been staying at home maybe way too long, and is just like really fearful now about going out at all and just resuming their normal life? They're just kind of really, um, they're just like, just like scared in their in their home, they just feel very insecure. What would you say to that person, uh, related to the fear of the Lord? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good, good question. Um, you know, being a Christian does not make us immune to bad things happening to us in life. So there's no way you can give a blanket guarantee of, oh, you fear the Lord, you're going to be fine in this world. But when we fear the Lord, we know that He has a greater plan. We know that we are eternally secure in Him, and that we can trust that He is going to going to work no matter what, but um, there are no guarantees in this life, and we accept that. I mean, one guy goes out and gets, gets COVID from a neighbor. The next guy was near that same neighbor, and he might not get it. I don't know why that happens, but I know who controls that. God controls that. So it wasn't an accident. If I were to get sick, that was part of God's plan. You know, if I stay healthy, that's part of God's plan. I don't always know why he's going to do that, but I know it's for my good. God's going to use it in my life. I have a good friend who went through this uh, COVID, and he's recovered. Did it mean, uh, he, oh, thank God that I got that? No, he, he probably wouldn't thank God that he got it. But I think in that time, he probably was drawing closer to God. He was praying. He was focused on God. I can tell you when I've gone through hard things in my life, it often causes me to get my focus back on him. And redirects me to him. Um, just like that young man you said that did the wrong thing. Hopefully he got a reminder. Like when I almost crashed in the ice. And it was scary. I, or the, you know, that young man, Edward, 
who got shot with 2,400 bolts, I'm hoping that causes him to realize, wow, I could have lost my life. But he didn't. And, you know, God gives us those opportunities to realize okay. he's still in charge. All right. Okay. Um, I've come off the street. I'm going to go back onto the street and uh, leave you guys to wrap up the, uh, the week. All Thank right. you, brother. Thank Sounds you. good. Hey, uh, Arcola, we love you guys. Um, again, we look forward to when we can all be together. Um, but for now, know that we're, we're uh, with you guys in spirit. We think of you all. We pray for you all. And we're glad to talk anytime. Man, I hope you have a great first meeting this week with your brothers. And really enjoy that. Love you guys. Hope to see you soon. God bless you.